Hi. So the next person I'm going to talk to is my very dear friend and theatre maker, Sarah Louise Young. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about touring, very specifically from a solo artist point of view. Um, what I find interesting about this interview is that she takes us through, I guess, of what is her process before she goes to a venue. Um, and also the... Uh, the ways that she methodically manages or micromanages the day that she's there. And then her, she also gives us her thoughts about how she feels after a performance, if it hasn't gone particularly well because of various technical problems. Um, yes, a real, really, really lovely toolkit about touring um, as a solo artist. And also we delve into our thoughts of the touring model within the UK and its uh, future and current state, etc. So enjoy. It's about 30 minutes. There are some notes at the bottom uh, which will link up to everything she says. Thank you very much. And don't forget to subscribe. Cool. Right. So hello, Sarah Louise Young. How are you? Hello. Russell Lucas. I'm very good, thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, now, we're here to talk to you, obviously, about uh, touring um, I would imagine specifically around the UK, although I do think that you've gone around Australia a couple of times. Not literally, obviously. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so we're here to talk about touring, but I think it'd be useful uh, for people who are watching this for you to tell us about yourself. Now, obviously, we can go away and Google you, so you don't need to give us your CV. Don't do that. That's no, a no, terrible <laughs> idea. You will find a porn star with the same name as me, so Googling is not advised. I've heard about that, yes. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> It'd be, what might be interesting is you tell us about the type of work that interests you, the type of work that you make, and maybe um, about what labels suit you the best, if one at all. You know, what are you these days? What, what do you feel most comfortable with? Are you a theatre maker? Are you an actress? Are you a performer? Who knows? Um, and then maybe what you've got coming up in the future as well. That'd be interesting, just to give you a bit of a, you know, who you are. And then we'll go back to the actual topic of touring. Yeah, I, I've been calling myself a theatre maker for quite some time, which doesn't exclude making things that might appear on a screen. Um, because I think the liveness of the event is what interests me the most. And that can be a live interaction with something that's pre-recorded. Um, a lot of my work falls into the genre of cabaret, uh, which again has, is a term which serves me well. Um, but I think theatre maker encompasses most of the work I make because sometimes it's just that it's in a theatre space. Obviously there are bespoke cabaret venues and there are theatre spaces, uh, but not all of my work is interactive, which I feel is the strand that belongs to cabaret. So, mm. theatre maker. Yeah. And what, have you, what are you working on at the moment? What have you got coming down the pipeline in theory? Ha, <laughs> there's always about 10 projects in my brain. Um, prior, to, prior to lockdown, I was taking three shows to the Edinburgh Fringe. And one of those was a show that we made together, An Evening Without Kate Bush which already existed and was made and was being restaged, but is being transformed into a two act version in the autumn. Uh, one of them was a brand new show called The Silent Treatment, which uh, was scheduled to perform at Summer Hall, which is probably the most personal piece of story making I've been involved with. So it's a slight shift from a more kind of um, musical, interactive, comedic piece into something a little bit more physical theater, uh, personal first per person story um, and then I was also directing and co-writing another show for another performer about Victoria Wood so mm. different tentacles in different places uh, but I also have a musical I've written with Michael Rilston which is set in the French horror theatre in the 1920s lots of blood and gore about uh, Paula Maxa who was an, uh, an amazing woman who was a real woman who was notoriously killed 10,000 times on stage um, <laughs> and then uh, various other pots on a simmer I tend to have about five or six things that could jump from being in research and development into production. And sometimes it's just that a venue becomes available or the timing of the person you're making with sometimes falls into, into alignment. Um, but there's, there's never nothing going on in my right. book. And it's safe to say, I mean, knowing what I know of you, you've also performed on camera, haven't you? You've done television and short films or films. Is that correct? Yes. It, when I first left drama school, I, I had a quite conventional acting career and I'd do a couple of guest leads on telly. And then I fired my agent uh, because I got three jobs off my own back, um, which I really wanted to do. And I felt quite resentful at paying them commission. So I left my agent. And that, that period of being out of the formal 
traditional represented actor mode meant that the, the only doors I wasn't knocking at was television. So it's been a while since I've done any television, but I've done some independent short films and things. And uh, so yeah, I, 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 I have been a, a series of pregnant psychopaths killing people in ongoing hospital dramas, but it's been a while. <laughs> but I, I mean, I know, again, knowing what I know of you, I think you are um, very much at home in the live performance at the arena, aren't you? I think that's your home. Is that safe to say that? You, you, your voice warped beautifully. I'm sorry. In answering of, uh, of that question. Did you or say uh, my home is in live stuff? Yes. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So it, there, seems that, of, yeah. it seems that your, your, um, your home is in the theatre. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's been interesting. The, one of the shows that we made together, Julie Madly Deeply, um, has been played to an audience of 50 and 700 people. And they're very different experiences, even though the show is the same. But I, it, it's, it's made me appreciate how much I enjoy smaller audiences and being able to specifically connect with individuals in that audience. And my, my hope is that at the end of any show, I've managed to at least make eye contact with everyone in the audience. And that's, that's as much to serve the production and the intention of the production. And it's also something very primal, I think, in me as a, as a human being and a performer about being seen and met and wanting to feel like what happened in that room, in that space, was unique to that evening. And I think that's, that's the kind of the intimacy junkie that I am. That's the kick I'm after is the live experience. And I get bored really, really quickly. I mean, the longest run I've ever done of a show is 10 months. And that was one nighters changing every single night. Right. And, and I don't know if I'd be capable of doing longer. It's different when it's work you make yourself, you get a separate hit because you obviously get the performer hit where you meet the audience and you feel, oh, we did a good thing tonight. And you get the writer hit of like, they got my joke or they you know they connected with my material yeah. but um yeah i'm ever shifting ever moving <laughs> okay um so you're here to talk to us about touring life um okay. now i think the, 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 the nice way to frame this would be to talk about your process uh probably before you get to a venue when you get to a venue and then maybe after you've been at the venue any sort of hot tips um, kind of baseline stuff would be really fascinating because I've done some touring but I'm nowhere near as much as you have and mine was mostly in the 90s around schools um, but uh, that, if we could start there and then maybe we'll go to um, how do you look after yourself artistically as well throughout that, that yeah. moment um, and then maybe towards the end we'll talk about the touring model within the UK I'd really be interested to know um, what you think of it right now, what do you think the future of it um, is? Because, mm. um, I mean, we'll come to this later, but Eileen Conant, a director I know, she, she said to me, um, she said the theatre model, the theatre touring model is broken in the UK, which I thought was a very powerful sentence to say. And mm. I thought about it after a while and spoke to other couple of people and they just kind of nodded. I was like, oh, okay, cool, right. So I'd be interested. Yeah. In but we'll get to that later. So, so tell us about your kind of pre, during, post, touring life what's it like and well I'm, I'm very aware also that I function a lot as a solo performer so most of the shows I've taken out have either been me on my own or with one other person so some of the things I'm saying might change if you're in a company or if or indeed if you can take someone out with you like a technician or a stage manager but if, I, if from my perspective this is sort of like um, the coal face of touring when it's you in a trundly suitcase and if you are the person who made the booking as well um, I always hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, I work on the assumption that everybody is doing their best, but of course, uh, sometimes you turn up at venues and they're not expecting you, they haven't read the tech spec you've sent them. So my, my ambition is always to try and put in as much security as I can before, so that then when I get throw, thrown curveballs when I arrive, at least I've at least I've coped. At least I've prepared as much as I can. And you know, it's it's so different. My, my experience has told me that normally venues who produce their own work, even if it's just a panto once a year, have a different relationship with their audience and with the venue. And one of the things I really appreciate having done a lot of one nighters is, is that you're going to turn up at a venue. They might have only just finished the get out from the night before. There's no reason why the people working there should love you or love your show. Um, you're going to be gone in six hours. So you have to kind of lower your um, 
your expectations of the world being as excited about your show as you are. But of course, sometimes they're brilliant and they bring you tea and sandwiches and it's great. Um, so the, the sort of the, the big thing is like the pre-visit, how can you prepare? And this is as much as when you're booking the show, you know, you might be speaking to someone in the booking department one day and someone in the tech department the next day, but as much as you can secure upfront. And these are things like, you know, what time do I need to get there? How much time have I got to do my tech? What equipment have you got? What do I need to bring with me myself? Um, is there a microwave? Really simple stuff like that. And um, you, the important document to make is called a tech rider. And this is like, you know, literally do I, what kind of lighting do I need? Um, you know, do I need microphones? Am I bringing a keyboard? Do you have a piano? Will it be tuned? And I used to, this used to be quite a small document and over the years it's got bigger. And I didn't want to be seen as a, as a diva for making requests for water and a lockable dressing room. But actually these are things that if they're, if they're spelt out, they protect you from running into difficulty on the day. Because especially if you're touring, a simple thing like a lockable dressing room is vital. You know, you're going to leave your laptop and your bags in there. So I put together a tech, a tech document that has everything I need technically, but also has a rider. Um, and it's only because I've done gigs where literally I've turned up and uh, I've been given a, a disabled toilet to change in, which the public are also using. So it, it seems silly to, to sort of be really, really basic that I need a room with a mirror and a place to hang clothes, but it's worth being that obvious with what you need uh, rather than running the risk of turning up and finding out that you're you know, performing in someone's garden. And I did turn up somewhere and find I was performing in a tent with no lighting rig. Uh, right. So <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> um, and, and you develop your own checklist that is specific to you and to your show, because of course some shows need things that others don't. And you know, at the end of every show, I go back to my checklist and I think, right, have I learned anything? Is there anything I could have done better or could have been more prepared with? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I always ask when I, when I book a show is, is who's the audience? It's really helpful to know where you're performing. Again, it depends on the show, but because so much of the stuff I do is interactive, I find out how they voted in Brexit. I found out what the, what the regular clientele is, what show is on the night before me, uh, what is this audience like? Because if there's any way that your show can be modified or just to be aware, what's the political climate in which you're bringing your show? And it does vary hugely from around the country. So it's like doing your homework on the space that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and just dropping people a line sort of like a week before, just going, just checking everything's okay. Um, you know, and hopefully a venue will have everything you need. Hopefully it will all be prepared. Uh, but sometimes it isn't. Um, I always ask if people want me to bring a printed script and nine times out of 10, they say no. And nine times out of 10, I get there and they wish I bought a printed script. So now I just bring a printed script and yeah. a coat hanger. <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's, and and you, you, you also learn, you know, especially on tour, you learn what you need. I, I think in my checkbook, I have, you know, uh, ibuprofen, a bottle opener, uh, <laughs> dry shampoo <laughs> all that kind of stuff and a coat hanger and snacks um, and it's other things like checking PRS if you've got music in your show so these are all really dull things but if you've done the homework before you come it makes it much easier um, and then like getting there again basic stuff you know if you're driving check the traffic ask them if the parking's included you know it's amazing when you negotiate a, a, a gig how many things we forget to ask like is the travel included in my fee when you know do you need me to bring an invoice really really basic practical stuff and you, you only kind of mess it up a couple of times before it becomes second nature um so like i do a lot of travel by train and i tend to one missed train in case the train is cancelled before arriving so if i need to get there for three i try and get there for one um again basic stuff but you only have to be stung once to be racing towards your show um can I ask a question? Again, have, you, have, yeah. you ever, have you ever made, I mean, because you, when we made our show together, you were, you were alluding to this, but do you ever make a show making sure it just fits in one suitcase because of touring? <laughs> yes, yeah. I always promise, I promise, I promise myself I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you do have to think about the onward life and if it is just going to be you in a suitcase, can you manage it? The other thing I learned the hard way is often I've made shows for Edinburgh when it's really, really hot and then you take it on tour and it's winter and I realise you need a winter costume because you get into venues and it's absolutely freezing. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, you know, stuff that you learn along the way. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Yeah, and, and so my big thing when I arrive at any venue is to check in with the front of house, check in with box office, find out how your sales are. And that's as much about your relationship with the venue. Like, you know, when you take a booking, you know, sometimes you're offered a box office split, sometimes you're offered a, a fixed fee. And I tend to find that venues that have paid you a fixed fee have done more work on the marketing because they've already parted with the cash, so they're incentivized. And that's not any disrespect to any venue that's working on a box office split. There are some amazingly brilliant, supportive, fantastic yeah. venues. But you, you're not responsible for the relationship they have with their audience. And it's, it's good to know. I find it helpful to know what the sales are like. And of course, they can pick up at the last minute. But in terms of it ma it managing your morale, you know, I've done tours where one day I'm performing to 500 people and the next to 16. It's just the nature of touring. So if I know there's going to be 16, it just allows me to manage my expectations for the show. And that doesn't mean the show is not going to be great. It just means I'm not going to get out on stage and then suddenly be disappointed. And it's also about your contract with the venue. You know, have they put your posters up? Um, the other really important thing is, is be, be polite. If I had one piece of advice for touring, it would just be be polite to everybody because once you're into that venue you are a guest in their home mm. and how they are how they treat you is often how they're being treated so again you might be in a venue where they've just had a whole bunch of redundancies maybe they're not paid enough maybe they've had a really late night get in and if you can come and be uh, professional and kind and courteous while still getting your job done that's a really big help and I always make a note of everybody's names so as soon as I get in and I know, okay, David's doing the lighting and Sandra's doing the sound, I write it down. And that's partly for me to be able to thank them at the end. Mm. But it also empowers me that if I do need something or if I have a difficult conversation or I specifically have a sound issue, I'm not just kind of like wandering in the dark going, please, can somebody help me? I said, some venues are wonderful and they'll make you feel really at home and they'll talk you through things. But you have to kind of be, um, you have to just be really on it because the show is only one part of your experience. As soon as you get through the door, you have to manage your time, you have to manage everybody else's time. You know, it's, it's things that people don't think about. Like if you're late and you phone and you let them know, you know, your train's being canceled. You know, most of the people in that building will have union tea breaks. So you can be halfway during, through something and then they have to disappear for half an hour. So it's just letting people have as much communication and information. America, America and Canada are very strong on that, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Just going back to your names, yeah. thing, I remember when we were in um, the Panasonic in Toronto, that was one thing I really picked up on what you did, the, the way you remembered everybody's names. Because I always think, oh, I must remember everybody's names, and then I don't. But now I've started to do it because I saw, I've seen you do it. And, uh, and, it was, uh, and the effect was, was palpable because they, they were then part of the company. Because obviously we were in yeah. there rep when we were with Sam. And, um, and it was, yeah, it was such a small thing but really really powerful and then they kind of hung out with it for the for the time we were there didn't they? yeah I mean I know this is you know thinking about kind of well-being you know I spent a lot of time on my own and um, I always remember the new Wolsey and Ipswich which is so lovely and they produce a lot of their own work and I ended up going out for drinks with the crew afterwards and and I, I felt like they were invested in the show um, and that's as much, you know, that's because they're really great people and they obviously, they have a great theatre and, you know, uh, but there's so much that you can do, like, you know, the first thing is never, to, you know, you've done your tech spec, you've sent everything in, but you can't assume it's been read. So that, that I think what a lot of pe people do is they kind of like, they blow in like the Moroccan wind and they go, right, here I am, let's tech the show, rather than, hi, I'm Sarah, this is the show. Did you get the tech spec? Is there any information you need from me? Yeah. and just checking that what you thought you'd agreed had been agreed. Um, and then it's about managing time. Um, because ideally you learn your show, you learn how much time you need and you give yourself a break between the end of tech and the performance, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So you have to sort of be prepared. Uh, and I always realize, you know, sometimes people working backstage in theaters, they're, office is a cupboard underground with no window and no air and they're, they're not talked to like human beings sometimes <laughs> so if you can be the visiting company who are just really friendly and really know their stuff mm -hmm. um i think one of the things i find most helpful is is having a really well prepared description of your show 
rather than assuming that they know how it works. So like the, the most obvious one for me is, you know, this is going to be, um, I'm doing the show on my own. It's a mixture of song and text, spoken word. I use a head mic. Some of it's improvised, but I'll always come back to the cue line for the cue. And if there's ever a problem during the run, um, it's the kind of show where we can communicate. So just wave a flag. So like giving, just really explaining the basics. Mm -hmm. I, I was part of an improvised musical for about 10 years. And the number of times we'd go out and try and tech that show and we'd explain, it's an improvised show. So we don't know which one of us is going to be speaking at any one time into the microphones. And the poor people doing the tech would go, so who are you playing and how will we know? No, and you have to keep re-explaining it because mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex thing to tech. I think, so I just think having those, those shorthand. Yeah. Say again. Yeah, just, uh, just going back to the term theatre maker as well, that, that really puts you in that camp, doesn't it? Because what you're doing is you're, you're, you know the skills that are required for them to deliver their job. I think that's really useful that you've also experienced that. You've experienced their side of the fence. And so you provide for that. You've thought about it. Um, I think that's what a true theatre maker is, the person who is able to encapsulate all the skills or at least appreciate them or understand how they work that then you can go into a venue and, and talk directly within the, the language that they use. Um, and you almost settle their anxiety, actually, I would say, because you've told them it's this, 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 and this. And part of them will go, oh, I can do that. Yeah, and it's really interesting, especially with the Julie Andrews show. I think a lot of people assume it's a tribute act. So they think, oh, you know, girls singing songs, Julie Andrews, tick, done, and they can switch off. And it, more often than not, when I've got to the interval of that show, whoever's operating the show has come back and said, oh, I love the show, I get it now. Like, I, get, I get what you're doing. Mm. And then that helps and act two runs even more swimmingly than, than the other one. And it's so much about approaching your show as if you hadn't made it and thinking, how would this look to an outside eye? And what's really important? What do I really need to run? Like there's a cue at the end of Julie Madly Deeply and it's really important that the timing is correct. And it's only ever gone wrong once. But that was enough for me to realize how important that cue was. So whoever's teching it, even if they've teched it before, I always, when I get to that cue, I say, now I'm going to run this cue twice. Um, I always run it twice just because it's an important cue. So it's not, I'm going to run it because you're rubbish or you might mess it up. But it's like, that's just, that's my non-negotiable. But then there are other bits. And I think, ah, do you know what, if, they, if we're running out of time and they haven't quite got that right, I'll leave that. But you start to just know what matters and what needs to be run and what doesn't. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking to get to an end of a tech and not be able to be prepared as possible. And to be honest, that, that has happened a few times and it's, it's always been communication. So there was one time we came to a venue and the person who'd been allocated us to operate it didn't know how to use the lighting desk. And they said, um, oh, yeah, I've just got to rig some lights, you know, go away and come back in an hour and a half. So great, fantastic. Go away, come back again. And they were still struggling. And I saw they had downloaded the manual and they were trying to learn how to use the desk because they didn't feel they could say to us, I'm really sorry. We don't know how to mm -hmm. run the desk. So we very quickly made the show work on subs, which if you don't know what subs are, basically they're like pre-programmed lighting states. So this very, very complicated, you know, 60 plot show got reduced to 10 lighting states now it's kind of a gift because i now know i can do that show in 10 lighting states and i know what they are but the next time that happened and it did happen like a, several weeks later i saw that the person was kind of just a bit uncertain and i said oh is this desk familiar to you and they said ah do you know what yeah no i don't really know it and i said would it be easier to do the show on subs and this kind of relief from them yeah uh, and so it just made me, I'd, and I'd already let go of the disappointment from the first time it happened that the show wasn't going to be the perfect version. So it's like I now have like dream perfect version of show, acceptable middle ground. And do you know what? We're just going to do this with one lighting state <laughs> because sometimes that happens. And it's, it's the set of, is it worth the stress of trying to get the perfect version? If I know that this person isn't capable, doesn't have the right equipment, and I think it's very humbling, but it also strength tests your material because if your material can work, I mean, the only thing really that can mess up a show is, is literal power failure. Mm. Um, and even then, you'd probably just sing in the dark. Um, mm. But it's the balance of communicating that without seeming like you're being patronizing or 
you're doubting their expertise. But literally in a very, very well respected London venue, I discovered that they had bought a top of the range lighting desk that nobody in the venue knew how to, to work, not even the person who had installed it. And someone was going on a workshop the next day, <laughs> like an hour wasted. And in the end, I finally said, is there a problem? And they finally told me. So it's yeah. when the, that only needs to happen to you a couple of times before you, you know, you, you anticipate it. But of course, some venues are a dream and everybody knows what they're doing and it's a joy and, you know. Mm. Okay, gosh. Pot, pot luck. <laughs> Would you, so, so if we um, move on to, or you kind of touched on already, like for instance, when you run a show on just subs, how do you, I mean, that is based on you preserving the show, isn't it? And preserving the experience. But you say that you made your piece with that a couple of weeks ago, but then does it come back again? Do you, do you, do you walk away and you think, oh my God, that was a complete muck up? Or have you really, how do you make your peace with that really? I think, I mean, I'm fortunate in that a lot of the work I make allows me to step off script and I have a rule with myself that if I have to manage a situation in the room, whether that's an audience interaction or a lighting change, if, it's, if, I, if I can get it, if the audience don't know about it, then that's great. I just won't acknowledge it. But if I have to go and speak to a technician or literally go and move a piece of furniture because it's fallen over or something, um, I try to, I, I, I work very hard that, it's, that there's no negativity and there's no criticism of the tech because you must look like a united front, even if inside you are fuming. And I found that audiences, when things go wrong, can be amazingly forgiving if you are positive about it. So you turn it into a positive, even if inside you're disappointed. And I think you can't preach that you love interactive, live, changeable theater and then be annoyed that something hasn't gone exactly to plan. So. Yeah you know most i think if you if your heart is in the right place and the storytelling is in the right place you just have to let it go and there are some shows a friend of mine said she has a rule with herself that she's not allowed to be positive or negative about a show anywhere any way beyond two hours afterwards she has like a window of two hours where she's allowed to just feel great or vent um but also you, you're not always the right judge i, I did a gig um in musselboro on a very rainy day and it was, a, it was a really tough show. And for some reason, the audience just didn't seem to be on board and the tech was difficult and we had interference from the local taxi company on our head mics and everything. And I was working with, um, with Michael Wilston, who's known me for a very long time. And we got to the end of the show and quite often we'll go to the pub afterwards. And if any audience want to come and meet us, they can. And I said, I'm not going tonight. I'm just not going. I've just been awful gig. <laughs> and he said, no, come on, let's just go for a quick one. And we got there and there was a lady, she won't mind me mentioning her name. She's called Enid. And Enid had come to seek us out. She was in her seventies, I would say. And she had had a scarf as a gift and she loved the show. And she told us her life story and how this was one of the most incredible evenings of her life. And I was thinking, I'm so glad we went to the pub. <laughs> I'm, so I'm so glad we went to the pub so sometimes i'm circumnavigating your, your question so sometimes what you think is a disaster isn't a disaster but you have to forgive what is not in your control yeah it's the it's the self-preservation thing i think even when i have my director hat on and i'm looking after actors in a venue and something goes wrong i have to make sure that the actor's atmosphere and support is still there for them and they still must go on stage that evening and that's one of the things that uh, you have to self-manage because you talk by yourself more often than not. Um, okay, cool. We're, we're kind of uh, coming to the last seven or eight minutes. Um, should we move on to the last thought about the model of touring itself? Um, I'd be interested to know, has it evolved over the years that you've been doing it? Is there, what, what's the next step of it? Or what, do you, what, would you look, would, what would you hope to see coming? Um, you know, maybe it's been, maybe it's fine as it is, I don't know. I think basically it's very hard for regional theatres to, to keep money and keep audiences. So the natural thing is they're going to take something that's been in the West End or something with someone off the telly. And I've definitely found it's increasingly hard to get audiences to see you, even if you've got all the five star reviews in the world. Um, uh, if you're not famous, it can be hard to get bums and seats. And it was, it was very humbling to do the Julie Andrews tour because as I said, we would be paying massive sold out houses some days 
and very small houses on the other days. But what it taught me was that there are venues who have such a good relationship with their audience and really know their audience. And for me, as someone who produces themselves a lot, they're the venues I want to have an ongoing relationship with. Mm. And, you know, there are venues that have started out as little places above a pub and then have grown into to bigger venues. Um, but it's not what it was. It was, and it's not a sure bet. And you see, I mean, you see, you know, I don't know, Rian, um, Agatha Christie's with someone off the telly and they're playing to nobody on a, you know, wet matinee uh, in January. So it's not a sure bet. And I think touring is, is, is tough. But I, it's interesting now, these smaller venues who are starting to take risks to book cabaret nights. And now that we as artists are more involved in the marketing of our shows and in those direct relationships. So there are venues that I go back to because I love the people and because I know they're invested in my work um, and audiences you can build a relationship with. But it is, yeah, it's it's tough to get bums on seats. It's really tough. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the um, one of the polls recently in the past couple of years have been that audiences would prefer to have new writing now. They, they're more likely to watch new writing than they are to go and watch something they've heard of or seen, one of the classics. Um, I, I, I almost know term the old joint stock theatre in Birmingham right now as well. That's, yeah. They're so lovely and experimental and always packed, right? Yeah. Always packed, they really are. You know, and um, uh, Hope Mill as well. It's like, just, just mix it up. And I think, you know, it's a case of if you build it, they will come, isn't it? It's that. Mm-hmm. You know, just you, you have to build it first. You've got to experiment, and but also well, you look at look at Hull Truck and John Godber, and that theatre is still thriving. And you know, places where the audience feel they have a connection to their theatre, I think that's really strong. And if you can keep that relationship, you know, I've got people I now go and stay with in Birmingham based on having done shows there. So you have to you have to have an invest in, investment in that place, not just as another tick location on your tour schedule, but mm. as a place you've bought your evolving work. Yeah, and I guess if the, the more eclectic work that they make, or at least host, then an eclectic audience will come with that as well, and then thus embellishing their audience for the future, the younger audiences mm. as well. Because you know, I, I concur, there are some venues that must fill those seats. They must fill them for financial reasons. For sure, but yeah, cool. Thank you so much. That was this my pleasure. That was a lot. I feel like I threw threw information at you. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm going to put I'll put lots of notes at the end of the link. There's loads of lots of stuff I didn't say. So. <laughs> <laughs>